one of the most valuable boxers in this sport. I've knocked out every single person that I've fought. International superstar Jake Paul takes on one of the most feared combat sports fighters of all time, Anderson Silva. In the most exciting fight spectacle of the year, Jake Paul, Anderson Silva, Saturday, October 29th, live on pay-per-view. Week two of the NBA season has tipped off, and DraftKings Sportsbook, today's video sponsor, is dishing out can't-miss offers. New customers sign up using the promo code SMOKE. Throw down $5 on any pregame money line wager, and DraftKings will toss over $200 in free bets if your pick cashes. That's right. All it takes is $5 on any pregame money line wager, and DraftKings will throw you $200 in free bets if your bet cashes. For those of you in states where sports betting is not yet available, don't forget about DraftKings Daily Fantasy, where they've been cooking up even more ways to win some cash this basketball season. Download the DraftKings Sportsbook app now. New customers use code SMOKE and receive $200 in free bets if the pregame money line bet hits after placing a $5 wager. That's promo code SMOKE, only at DraftKings Sportsbook. Welcome back, all the smoke. We got a good one today, man. My former teammate, our brother, uh, just a good all-around human being. Real one. You don't find too many of the good around all-around human beings. Man, welcome to the show, Karan Butler. Well, What's up, bro? Me, Tough juice. Appreciate, Appreciate you, you both. You're here looking clean. Hey, man, I'm Woo. corporate thugging right corporate now. Corporate so thugging. Man. I like it. <laughs> corporate thugging. Just wrapped uh, season two as the Miami Heat. Uh, assistant coach, being able to kind of make a full circle. That's where you started your career at. Now you're back there coaching. How's that experience been? You know what? It's It's been amazing because I think that, you know, coaching is a selfless sport. And um, obviously it's a selfless act as well. So just being able to pour back into some of these brothers and, you know, give them that wealth of insight and information that's needed. You know what I mean? Like in the course of the season. It's been therapeutic for me. And then also just you know, knowing that they definitely need it in the course of the season to, like, just amplify whatever talents that they have mm -hmm. or who they are. So it's been a blessing. I think guys like you are in great positions because something that Jack and I always talk about on the show is the lack of vets in the locker room. And you remember when we all came in the league, there was 36, 37, 38-year-old dudes that was just there. Whether they played or not, they contributed in major ways. I mean, obviously, you guys have a super vet in UD, but how important do you feel like that is? I mean, although you're removed from actually playing, you're still in the locker room back on the coaching side, but how important do you feel like that is it, that the NBA is definitely lacking right now? Man, it's, it's, it's so important. Like having someone like UD, I just think like he's the the blueprint for you know all vets and how the organization and how a system should be ran from top to bottom. When you talk about having a cornerstone of a franchise still there that been through the wars, mm -hmm. been through the battles, uh, you know championship pedigree, and uh, still able to relate and connect in the locker room, still can throw them out there, play spot minutes, mm -hmm. and then also he's able to you know, just be that voice and that bridge between us and the coaching staff to the locker room. Right. I think more teams and organizations need to, you know, revisit that. I know a lot of teams don't want to give up that roster right. spot, but it's extremely important. Like the value of Udonis Haslam in that locker room is just, Unbelievable. is priceless. You can see it. Yeah, 100%. Past season, Miami was number one. You know, y'all beat Philly. Y'all had some ups and downs. We didn't get to the uh, championship to get to the goal. Talk about this season and what, and what y'all got out of it? I mean, we, we got a, a lot out of the season, and I'll and I tell you why, just because obviously we know that we was missing a lot of people. COVID season was prior to that. But this season we had pretty much, if you want to look at it from a real basketball, like, head position, we had three dead roster spots at times, like guys that really wasn't in the rotation. Mm -hmm. We missed Jimmy for a significant uh, amount of games. We missed uh, Bam due to surgery. He was out mm -hmm. for, like, six to seven weeks, and then, Obviously, UD not being in the rotation, but still being a voice. So we still was able to manufacture the number one seed in the Eastern Conference in the course of being, you know, like edited so many players throughout the course of so this mix, maxing so many 
uh, different lineups throughout the course of the season, but we found a way just to, you know, get quality wins and keep that momentum throughout the whole course of the season. Grind it out. Jimmy Butler, that shot, you know, who else going to shoot it? Which, what was your aspect? I mean, what was your, what were you thinking when he took that shot? That shit going in. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like, yeah. right off top, yeah. I was like, you know, you got to live and die by, you know, your franchise guy. Got and to. Th throughout the course of the season, um, Jimmy's done some things that people, oh, shit, like, why he do that? Uh, he, he's that dude. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's good that come with that and it's some bad that come with that. I felt like that was the right shot because... I think it was like 17, 16.8 on the clock. They still had a timeout, so, you know, Al Horford is retreating, mm -hmm. and he's going at him. He probably would have fouled him. And I just felt like, you know what, he was like, shit, I'm going for the game. Mm -hmm. yeah. you know, and all we got to do is get a kill on the opposite end. It's an SOB play. They're going to draw up, so let's go for the win. Mm -hmm. And if he went, if he would have hit that shot, what the fuck we would have been like saying? A whole different mm -hmm. ball game. He that dude. Yeah. Right? And he's still that dude even though it didn't go in. Right. He'll be back right back at that shit next year. Right. He's a different kind of superstar, like almost a blue-collar superstar. Mm. Exactly what that, and he embodies uh, Miami Heat basketball. What, what makes him different? You've got a chance to play with superstars. You've been a star yourself. What makes Jimmy Butler different? Because I feel like he's kind of a Swiss Army knife. He could be the leading scorer. He can get all the assists. He can get stops on defense. He can rebound. He makes winning plays. What makes him different since you've been with him day to day? I'm glad you said that because I think you nailed it. A lot of people, like, like myself, when I played, I was just like, shit, I'm, I got to get a bucket. <laughs> to have my true impact on the game, I got to get a bucket. I got to be a problem. I got to draw a double team, shit like that. Jimmy is just a winner. Mm -hmm. Like, mm -hmm. at the end of the day, he don't give a shit if he got seven points, but he's going to win this matchup, and obviously he's going to have his fingerprints on ultimately moving the needle for the quality win. So that's all he care about. I've played in, in locker rooms and on teams with dudes that really cared about their shit. Mm -hmm. The bottom line, like, getting their numbers. Mm -hmm. But he just care about the dub. Mm -hmm. Love it. Where do you think y'all need to improve? Well, right now with the loss of PJ, we have uh, Caleb Martin, who's going to try to fill that role. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, he adds, you know, some more youth, some athleticism. We'll see what happens. You know, one of the things that was glaring to me was... When you look at the Boston Celtics and, you know, those, those two monsters and Brown and Tatum, mm -hmm. they posed a lot of issues. Yeah. And, you know, Jimmy was trying to will it. Um, he did a remarkable job at, you know, going up against the two, three best players mm -hmm. in every series. But, you know, he, he kind of ran on fumes at the end. You know, mm -hmm. he had to score 40-plus points for us to, you know, even have a chance to get a quality win. And the other guys stepped up majorly, but... You know, Tyler, he's going to have to improve physicality of the game. He's going to have to get better, and he's working on that. You know, everybody's going to have to move the needle in their process yeah. uh, tremendously this summer, and everybody's out here grinding. Like, you know, they're probably doing the nightlife shit, but they also Didn't grinding work and working, working on their craft. Mm -hmm. Talk about Spo. Um, me and Matt know, we, you know, we both respect the shit out of Spo. He's one of the great, one of the best coaches to ever coach, and uh, he came up under Pat Riley, and, you know, I think Pop do a great job of bringing his – some uh, Hall of Fame coaches up under him, too. And Spo, um, I, one thing I like about Spo, he didn't really go too far away from what Pat Riley taught him. Mm. You know what I'm saying? And, and uh, just give, just talk, talk to us about Spo, because a lot of people don't talk about him much, and he don't talk much. And he don't give a shit. Yeah. Like, if you're not talking about him, he just care about results. The mm -hmm. same as Jimmy, and I think that that's why the marriage between our organization, Spo being at the helm of it, and Jimmy with our franchise player is just like so perfect because they don't need all the accolades, they don't need the symbolic recognition, they just care about the end of result, getting wins, putting banners up, and um, we're trying to, you know, get one together with Jimmy as our head. But, you know, Spo, tell you a quick story about him. During the course of the pandemic, I was just doing like a lot of CNN shit, uh, sending over this edits on NBA TV about the game of basketball in the film room, chopping up the game. And I guess Spo had probably caught some of the stuff, and he was like, man, you need to seriously consider coming on the sideline and being a coach. I wrestled with the, the thought of it for about a week, and he hit me back, and he was like, I got a seat for you. Like, come over here, you know, join the culture. And wrestled with it again for a day, and I thought about what organization that get it right every time. Hmm. San Antonio, Miami Heat, and there's probably another one out there, but definitely the Miami Heat. Mm -hmm. And it's been a great experience. I've learned so much about preparation, about the schemes, and just, you know, really coaching every player. 
because we're all different in a unique mm -hmm. way. Right. And it's really tapping in and moving the needle with every guy. There was a moment that went viral um, heading into the playoffs, and I remember I was out on ESPN when it all was going down. Um, when Jimmy got into it with Spo, and then UD kind of stepped in, and all the outside people looking in, oh, this is a problem, this is going to be an issue for this team. I looked at it on the flip side, like, this shit happens all the time, and to me, I think you guys are going to get closer. And I said on TV, I think you guys are going to grow closer from it. Mm -hmm. Talk to us about that kind of stuff that people don't, if you don't really know the game, you don't understand, but that kind of shit sometimes needed, and that's the kind of thing sometimes to bring you guys closer, and you guys went on a great run it after happens. all that shit happened. And you know what? Uh, shout out to you for speaking on that, because I remember, you know, I... I watched because I've been in the, the, the media space before and I was watching like, okay, what the fuck is the narrative going to be mm -hmm, about mm -hmm. us? Because mm -hmm. we know about us, but right. nobody else know about right. us and everybody else just assuming. And I remember keenly that, you know, you said exactly what you just said, like they're going to be connected. Uh, they're going to rally around this moment. And, you know, it's, you know, some real shit need to be said. It was uncomfortable mm -hmm. on the fly. You know, UD, you know, stepped up and, you know, we shit, we had it went went to dinner after that. Mm -hmm. You know, it was chill. It was just right. like one of those moments, like no love lost and nothing but love gained from that experience. There has to be a certain level of respect though happened, and understanding dog. like yeah. that, and in a culture like that. Because like I said, that shit happens all the time. It's just not caught on camera. A lot Some, of times with teams though, when those moments don't happen, that's when the shit you gotta really worry. get yeah you know fragile, mm -hmm. and that's yeah. when it get fractured and mm -hmm. stuff. That's so. the best moments. That's the realest moment. You learn from them. Um, switching gears, your childhood, born and raised, Racine, Wisconsin. Yeah. Talk to us about your upbringing and your struggle and just your perseverance to be able to, even though there's a bunch of crazy shit going on and some shit happening to you, being able to make your way through it. You know what? I was just intrigued by, like, like a lot of young people, like just intrigued by all the wrong shit <laughs> that was going on out there. Mm -hmm. And I felt like I had to, you know, be involved in pretty much everything, like from you know, hustling and carrying pistols to, you know, just being a, trying to mimic the men in my family or who I thought was my mentors, everybody ahead of me. And then, you know, from those experiences, like being incarcerated, I think it like this really humbled me, slowed me down. Obviously it saved my life, but it slowed me down like a motherfucker because I had to really just look at life slower. Like, I was becoming a failure to the people that sacrificed the most for me, my mother and my grandmother. I already had a kid at the age of 13. So, you know, I was like, damn, like, her father a felon mm. already. And it's like, how do you process that shit? Hold on, I'm, so you had your first, I didn't mean to cut you off, you had your first child at 13? Yeah, I had my mm. first child at 13. Yeah. And, um, you know, I just, you know, I grew up without a father, so I didn't want my habits to continue down right. that path. So I had to like really make a, a judgment decision where I already knew what the outcome of the path that I was leading was going to lead to. Mm -hmm. I was going to continue to get incarcerated. Somebody was going to blow my shit back or I was going to have to do something to somebody. So fast forward, I just said, you know, I'm going to just try this square, straight and narrow shit. Like, I'm just going to try this lifestyle and see where it leads me. At what age did you start making that decision? About 15 and a half, 15, 16. Um, it was right after I got sentenced to two years mm -hmm. in corrections. I did 18 months. I got out. I was on papers. I clicked up with this uh, traveling team, George Bray Community Center. They were sponsored by Nike. They just got taking me around the world and just competing against some of the baddest dudes out there at the time, Quentin Richardson, Corey Maggette. Talk about a lot of this in the book. Yeah, yeah. you know, and just getting at it, you know what I mean? Like, my first tournament where I really got recognized was uh, the Peace Jam. Mm -hmm. I wasn't even supposed to be there. We're going to Junior Peace Jam next yeah. weekend. See what it's I'm saying? Clearance. Like, it's yeah. still going because mm -hmm. it's a major tournament, but I wasn't even supposed to be there because, one, I was on probation. Two, I had a bracelet, so, like, I had to... Manufacturer. You was the first one to play with the ankle monitor? So no, Cole, well, I'm Cole about wasn't? to tell you, I was not supposed to be there, so I took the bracelet off. <laughs> and I left the bracelet in the house. Mm. So they, they thought I still was, you know, in the region. And I went to a tournament, played in it, and I got on. Mm. So the headlines in the paper was like, you know, this kid has arrived. And my PO was like, you wasn't even supposed to be out the mm. state. So that was the issue. Uh, did seven days for that. And then, like, my basketball story took off from that moment, though. Mm. Mm, mm, that's crazy. Was at that point you fully, you don't never fully, but left the streets alone, okay, this is my, this is what I'm going to do. Was it at that, that point right there? I was always, like, straddling the fence yep. still. 
like, be honest. Like, we keeping it a buck. Like, I was still, you know, dipping and dabbing, but still, like, leaning more 80-20 towards the positive shit than, you know, being in the streets. But all my homies were still in the street. You know, all my homies were GDs. You know, we, we hung together. We were still in the same neighborhoods. We still was flagging. It was what it was, but mm -hmm. they saw something that they saw in me that they didn't see in themselves. They saw that I found my niche. Mm -hmm. I had an opportunity. So it was the first time that I seen something like this, like in my community, because, you know, we just got that crab in the barrel mentality, but they rallied around my gift. Hmm. They was like, you know, we're going to support you, King. Like, you about to mm -hmm. be you one of the us one. that made it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Beautiful. Talk about <laughs> your experience with UConn, Jim Calhoun. I was shocked that I actually went there. Um, my Muslim mentor, by the brother by the name of uh, Jamil Aguari, I wanted to go to St. John's, and he was like, UConn is the best spot for you because they produce the most God wings at your position, and they know how to get you there. You know what I mean? So if you go through this system, uh, you're going to be better for it. And I didn't have that evaluation. I wasn't looking at it like that. I was just like, I'm going to New York. Like, if <laughs> I get a chance to get out of Wisconsin, you know, it's a lot of land, a lot of cows, a lot of cow tipping, a lot of, you know, milk. Dairy products. I'm, I want to go to the big city if mm -hmm. I can, can. If I can do it from the gift of my talents of playing the game of basketball, but it was the best decision I ever made because Calhoun really poured into me. And when he came into my household, sat down with my mother, and my grandmother. You know, if anybody can be bought, you could be sold. When you talk about finances, when people come trying to buy you and sell you on universities, he didn't come with a bag. He came with just some information that was true. He said, if you commit to this university, you're gonna be family forever. And he meant that. That's what sold me on the whole process. Instead of somebody coming to your living room saying, hey, we got 50000 or 100000 mm -hmm. for you, which is dope because we needed it. We was broke. But he talked to me about just the importance of, like, what he was going to pour into me, and I was going to be a man, a better man from that experience at UConn. Uh -huh. What was it like having all that success at UConn, though? Like, you got a lot of players that come up out of the Big East Player of the Year, lead the team in scoring, lead eight. It, it was dope because they made it easy for me. Like, the, the system was already in place. You know, it's, it's kind of like the Zags, and I ain't promoting the Zaga, but they never rebuild. They just reload. Mm -hmm. They find guys that, like, fit a certain prototype of what they're trying to do, and mm -hmm. they just, like, plug and play. Plug and play guys. Yeah, yeah. and that's the same thing with UConn. It was, like, the perfect fit for me. It's like, dude, like, oh, you like coming off screens? Oh, here you go. You like the wheel action? Here you go. You like iso -ing? There you go. Like, and it enhanced me so much. It also just helped me be a better person as far as, like, walking around the campus, like, going against the highs and lows, and uh, being in the middle of nowhere, uh, you know, away from your family, but being a part of such a diverse community. You know, like I never seen, you know, um, white and black people like in, in, in like such a small like space, mm -hmm. like interacting and clicking. Like the south side of Racine was just, you know, predominantly black and brown folks. The, the north side was, you know, the upper echelon of white folks. So it was just like to see that type of integration uh, on a college campus, it, it, was, it was pretty dope. Welcome to Fresh Ball Fall. It's a season of pumpkin spice and making sure your crotch looks nice. That means sipping cider in the fall breeze and using Manscaped products to trim your balls with ease. That's right, today's show is brought to you by Manscaped, a company here to make sure all your foliage isn't the only thing shedding its excess leaves. Heck, even Mother Nature knows it's time to lose excess clutter for the fall. Whether you're brand new or already with us at Manscaped, you can use the crown jewel to take care of your family jewels. The Platinum Package 4.0. With this glorious package, you can align all your entire hygiene routines with one swoop. Inside the 10-part Platinum Package is everything you need to know and love about the Performance Package. Plus, some shower goodies included to elevate your grooming game to Platinum. The Lawnmower 4.0 Body Trimmer and Weed Whacker Nose and Ear Hair Trimmers feature proprietary skin-safe technology to protect the delicate parts and holes. Both are waterproof, so you can keep scaping even as the weather's changing. In addition to shaving, you can now completely upgrade your shower routine with the Ultra Premium Body Wash and Ultra Premium 2-in-1 Shampoo and Conditioner. It'll have your skin and hair feeling hydrated and smelling fresh. Don't forget to apply their aluminum-free Ultra Premium deodorant. And don't worry, it's not pumpkin spice. It's cologne quality fragrance. But we shouldn't save our signature scent for our pits. 
Use the Crop Preserver Ball Deodorant and Crop Reviver Ball Toner to make sure your go-to smell is top shelf and not sweaty balls. Manscaped even threw in two free gifts to their Platinum Package 4.0. The Manscaped Boxers and Shed Travel Bag, both specially made to hold your goodies. Get the Platinum Package this fall. These products are guaranteed to be hits for your dangly bits. Go to manscaped.com and get 20% off and free shipping with the promo code SMOKE only at manscaped.com. Again, that's 20% off with free shipping at manscaped.com when you use the code SMOKE. Manscaped has cleared out the leaves and it's time for your tree trunk to shine. So you stay for two years. Uh, you decide to make a jump. Uh, was that an easy decision? Or was it time you knew it was time to go? Did the coach tell you it was time to go? How'd that work out? The correct answer to say yes, I, I knew it was, a, it was an easy decision for me to, to get out of there because I felt like I was better than everybody else. Not just on my team, but I felt the like country. just across the board. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? I didn't know it was a motherfucker out there by the name of Yao Ming that was seven foot five or whatever that was just looming, that was going to be the number one pick. But I just felt like looking at the lay of the land, watching ESPN, like I was like, oh, he the top five pick? I'm better than him. Mm -hmm. He number six? I'm better than him. So I was just like, it's my time to go. And it was an easy decision for me too, like financially, because if I'm going to be a lottery pick, I can provide for my family. I can create first generation riches and eventually turn into wealth. So it was an easy decision. So I remember you, so you go number 10, but you were emotional. Like you really felt like you should have went higher. And I think the, the, the emotion of just everything kind of poured out at once. Talk to us about when you actually were drafted. Yeah, so I was promised by three teams that I was going to go before the seven pick. Before seven? Before seven. Obviously, it was a lie. So I'm sitting there mm -hmm. at the table, and I'm like, damn, another one. And then the last promise, I was like, damn, again, another one. So then I was thinking, like, maybe it's the background check stuff, and, you know, people can't get jobs because they got felonies. Mind so, like, racing. when they do the background check with NBA stuff, who you hang with, what's this, where you come from, all that stuff, I'm like, maybe that is my Achilles heel on this whole process, and that's the reason why I'm not getting drafted. And they brought me here to be an example for that. Mm. And that's the way I'm thinking, my wavelength, how I'm thinking at the table. So um, I'll never forget Raymond Brothers, my agent. We go into the, the bathroom in the back, and we start talking. Spike Lee walked through, and he see us praying, and he like even like joined the prayer for a minute. And I was just like, I can't remember the words of what he said, but he just told me that, you know, it's all going to pan out. It's all going to work at the end. I mean, went back out, sat at the table, and um, my name was called. And I had an outpour of emotion because the, the sacrifices that went into mm -hmm. getting to that point and then having the dream, sitting at that table, and then thinking it wasn't going to happen, yeah. And then all of a sudden hearing your yeah. name, like reality, then going up there and shaking the commissioner hand, that shit was like, it was uh, real. Mm -hmm. Yeah. First year, tough, 25 wins. Uh, first team all-rookie, came out the gates with 15 and 5. The next year you draft D-Wade and Trey for Lamar Odom. So you see you guys are trying to build something. What is your first impression on both of them? I always loved D-Wade because we played in the circuit together. Uh, the couple of AAU tournaments that I did go to that he was always at with the Illinois Warriors. And... He always had like a big ass brace on his leg. You know, he was always battling D in injuries and things like that, but he just had a uh, unique like hustle to him. He used to strap up defensively. He just had an edge. As far as like Lamar, I mean, he was always a household name for mm -hmm. all of us. You know, Lucky Lefty, he was coming down like most versatile big out there. The goods. Yeah, the goods. So like when he came to Miami and we was able to manufacture a deal and get him when the Clippers dropped the ball, we was like the young core. Mm -hmm. I was like, damn, we're going to be dope for like ever, for years to come. And I'll never forget like with D-Wade, he didn't have a jump shot then. But Stan Van Gundy just said, you know what, I'm going to put him in a pick and roll and see what that looked like. Mm -hmm. And obviously that's when he became Flash mm -hmm. and the rest is, you know, top mm -hmm. three, two guards ever. What was that experience like, though? Because, I mean, shit, Miami on top of that is a dope city. You guys got a nice young core. What is the vibe and the energy around the, uh, <laughs> the, uh, the city but the organization like? Yeah, I'm going to tell you, it was, it was not a basketball city, not a basketball state. Still isn't, but it's getting there. It's all about football. It's always been about football. Um, but... I think the foundation, uh, the cornerstone of the organization, uh, Lonzo Mourning started it. He started the momentum. 
you know, us going out there as youngsters, going to play in Zoe Summer Groove and stuff like that, it just kind of took a life of its own. But when you had someone like D. Wade, you know, uh, one of the top 25 players ever to play the game of basketball in the mix of, you know, his prime, I just think that, you know, basketball just took new life. And then now fast forward to, you know, 2010 and everything that happened with, you know, LeBron, Chris Bosh, and all those guys joining, it has become like just an environment for basketball. Like Miami is, you know, just crazy right now. They love the game of basketball. It got a, a, a nice pulse in the city. It's growing. You know, if you're trying to be an entrepreneur, it's the spot to be right now. Mm -hmm. um, you know, talking about Bitcoin, cryptocurrency, everything. It's like all the major conventions are held there, so it's it's a dope spot to be. Mm -hmm. 2004, you was in a Shaq trade. Talk about Bean, being able to uh, link up with Bean. Rest yeah. in peace. Yeah, our brother. Like, uh, I, I'll never forget, like, coming back from Antigua. I was doing a basketball without borders camp or clinic for the Miami Heat and the stroller was going across. This was like when everybody used to watch ESPN around the clock type shit and I'm walking through the, the airport and they like Shaquille O'Neal coming to the Miami Heat. I was like, damn, we about to be like dope leaving the Miami Heat and my name, they had a LeBar name. I was like, oh, shit. Like, that's how this worked? Like, <laughs> I thought I was here forever. I just bought a crib. Like, I can't mm. sell my crib. I just bought it. Like, it was, it was just, like, all that emotional attachment. But um, that, was just, that was just a crazy experience, one, just to be a part of that whole process and then going to Los Angeles. And I'll never forget, Kobe signed a deal for 130 plus million dollars. I'm at the press conference, and it's actually a double press conference because they're introducing myself, Brian Grant, Lamar Odom to the city of Los Angeles. And then Kobe signing his deal. And I'll never forget, like, looking at that money. And then the first thing he turned to the right said to me was, get ready to fucking black out. Like, get ready to work out. Like, let's take that shit to another level. And it, I'm talking about the blackout sessions was crazy. Uh... The reason why I was an all-star player, the reason why I'm in the coaching space is because my time that I spent with Kobe Bryant. Mm. What was he like off the court? Basketball genius. All he talked about was the, the game. Uh, I started watching film with him on every plane trip, just analyzing like the rotations, the schemes, the double teams, where they was coming from. Uh, how to manipulate the defense. Um, I, learned the, I learned a whole bunch from uh, Bean. And also, too, you know, when you talk about life after basketball, he gave me like a jewel that stuck with me. Um, the roar of the crowd is not for you, it's for what you can do. And as soon as you can't do it, they would be cheering for someone else. So, like, work on your second act mm. while you're in the midst of your first. Uh, I mean, he did other stuff. Obviously, he touched, you know... Jack and I, in, in, in uh, you know, he, a really meaningful way. But, I mean, he wrote the foreword for your book. Um, you know, came to your hometown, ate, broke bread with your family. And not a lot of people get to see that side of Kobe. You saw it. I was fortunate enough to see it. But tell us what that side of him is like when it's not the basketball talk subsides for 30, 45 minutes, yeah. an hour. What's that side of Kobe? Yeah, it's, it's, it's unique because, like, I saw him, like, literally put his guard down. Mm. Like where it was like I heard all this these things about him before I got there. Like, don't fuck with him. He he's stand. He's selfish. He's this. He's that. And once I got there, he would the first thing I saw he was just standing on business. Mm -hmm. So I was just like, like I fuck with that. Like he, all he doing is mm -hmm. he's standing on his business. And then um, I start like asking him stuff, and he like man sit right here. Like let's talk. Like and he just became like so welcoming. I'll never forget, we got to Milwaukee, and, you know, my family usually throw down when I come in town, like big block party, barbecue, everything. So I told Lamar, like, you want to come down, pull up? He's like, all right, cool. He's like, ask Cole. Everybody was laughing, like, him yeah, motherfucker ain't coming. Like, Cole, you want to come uh, eat some ribs and shit and just kick it? Okay. He's like, yeah, what, what time? I was like laughing at them dudes, like, see what I'm saying? Like, mm -hmm. he, he came. He the real ones. Yeah, he came, he sat down, he... Kicked it with everybody. Um, one of the most memorable moments of, you know, my life because the whole hood came out, the whole community. 
and he sat down, he ate with everybody, he just chopped it up, poured into him, gave him all life. That's just who he was, mm -hmm. you know, like that's the side of Kobe a lot of people didn't get a chance to experience or see because he was always standing on business. But I think more of the stories came out, you know, after, uh, you know, he lost his life and mm -hmm. everybody just started speaking on it a little bit more. Understanding, yeah. Um, 2005, traded to the Wizards. You joined forces with the one and only Agent Zero and Antoine Jameson. Uh, what was your first impression of that situation? Uh, you were obviously at the top of your game at that time uh, with two other high power players. What was that situation like in Washington for you guys? Man, I was excited to go there because one, I I watched that playoff series. I was in Chicago and I went to the game. Uh, Chicago playing the, the Wizards the year before mm -hmm. with Larry Hughes and you know, they had injuries, but it was a hell of a battle. Gilbert hit the huge game winner to get them out that, that round in that series. And I was just like, like that, I want to be on that squad. Mm -hmm. With Larry Hughes though, mm -hmm. you know what I'm saying? Like, I was just like, I can, be on that and we was always talking about like small ball and shit like that even in that era and Larry Hughes left and I was in negotiations with the Lakers and they put out a number out there I wasn't comfortable with signing and I was just trying to orchestrate a trade and get out of there you know and uh, Washington was the, the, the landing spot for me um, and I wanted to be there because I just knew that you know obviously Gilbert was a bucket and you know he was a superstar and Antoine was you know a spacer and a star in his own right and I was just like I can really compliment those dudes That's if right. I go you're in between just, the middle of both be, of them just be my shit mm -hmm. just do my thing first of all how talented was Gilbert and what kind of work ethic did he have uh, he was one of the hardest workers and I, I played with obviously we talked about Kobe um I played with KD played with Russell Westbrook Chris Paul obviously we shared that experience uh Giannis, list of all the superstars out there. Uh, Gilbert's probably number two on that list. Behind Cole, Dirk, right? obviously. Yeah. But yeah, he's right top, behind top, Cole. top three. Like, top three hardest worker dudes. Like, you know, a little quirky, but he has some shit to him. Yeah, but he burnt out. He was a he was a dog when it came to that that work and like he had like a four year stretch, maybe five, where nobody in the league wanted to see him coming. I mean, not no a, team, not a no organization wanted to see him. Not a soul. Now, counter to that, what kind of character was he? Uh, super playful. Mm -hmm. Super playful. Um, had a lot of... He, he, he didn't take anything serious. And, and you're the opposite. Yeah, You I know was, when to have fun, but you're serious. You're about, like, mm -hmm. you're about the business. Always. Yeah. yeah. And, and then Antoine was like a, the mediator. Okay. Like, he was in the middle. <laughs> and then... Gilbert was like, like I said, he was just a jokester all the time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, still is. Uh, you guys run into LeBron the first round, three years in a row, uh, guarding him at that time. Uh, what was your strategy guarding? This is a young Brown really kind of coming to his own. This is when I knew LeBron was special. Um, this, this all happened in, in one play. We played him three years in a row in the playoff series, but this is when I knew he was special. We tried to go under on pick and rolls. That didn't work. We try to go over, try to bully over. We try to shoot the gaps. Uh, we try to stay connected. We try to meet them in transition. <laughs> Tried everything. We try to weak them. <laughs> um, strong them. We, we, we blitzed them. Uh, we try to red, send the double team, late blacks. We showed him literally every coverage in the playoff series, and he dissected it. Mm. And I was just like, he different. That's when I knew I was like, Dog, as long as he stayed, you know, available and durable, like he's gonna probably shatter just about every record. And our main thing was just, even when we went to Dallas, even when we went to other teams, it was just like, let's try to win before he figure it out. Because <laughs> it's coming. Because it's coming. Because he's too. He's just a basketball mind. He's, he's brilliant. So let's try to win as many as we can, or however way we can manufacture to win one before he figure it out. So you saw, obviously the world saw the growth coming, but you get a chance, because you know when the light, the season's great, but when the lights come on in the playoffs, it's a little bit different. You saw that three years in a row. How much from the first time you played him, and I'm sure he was great then, to the last time you played him in the playoffs in that three-year span, had he improved? You know what? It, it, it got, his jump shot got better. Uh, his reads got quicker. Uh, he was, like, he was very intentional on exactly what he wanted to do on the basketball court. Whereas before he was just playing, he was just like steamrolling over people. 
But at the at the end, it was just like he was just playing a game. He knew exactly how he was going to beat you. First quarter, I'm going to play with you like this. Second quarter, all right, I'm going to score a little bit. Now y'all going to have a different coverage. Now I'm going to get, you know, to J.R. Smith. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to set the whole stage. And then at the end, I'll just use my star power to get to the line, get y'all in the bonus quick, and win the game. So, like, he <laughs> had a strategy just, right. like, going – he was just checking all the boxes every game. All right, this is how I'm going to beat y'all this game. And it was just like, damn, like, dude's just different. Mm. Yeah, mm. brain speed. Right. I mean, obviously, he was great, but you was in your bag in 2007, 2008. You were uh, an all-star. What was that experience in that run for you, like, personally? Yeah, it, w it was dope because I think as as players, uh, obviously, we, we have a, a checkbox of our own, like, when we come into the league. One, you know, whether people like it or not, you want to be a household name. You want to be respected by your peers. You want to get the bag. You want to be an all star. Mm -hmm. You want to get a chip. And you want to get the like get the hell out. That's like that's the checklist that you know all of us have um, as players, as competitive players. And you know I was able to check one of those things. You know check one of those boxes by making an all star team. And you know my best year was you know pretty pretty much even though I was a isolation player, it came from being with great teammates. Mm -hmm. Like, Gilbert made sure I was successful. Antoine made sure I was successful. I played in the Princeton offense, you know, getting 21 a game that that's season. Not so easy. That's exactly. not easy. That's like <laughs> yeah, not easy. Yeah. Like, the ball finds energy, mm -hmm. and it, it found me. You know what I mean? So it was it was like a dope experience. Mm -hmm. uh, good running uh, in, in D.C. You hit Dallas for a year. What was it like playing with Dirk? One of the best shooting bigs ever, if not the best. The best. Yeah, and I, I think people don't give him enough credit. Just like when you talk about international players, immediately you talk about Olajuwon, uh, MVPs, all that stuff. But, you know, Dirk was no joke. I mean, I think the one blemish, but it was because y'all was so great with the We Believe team. Like, people always go back to like, well, you know, he didn't show up. That was the MVP season. They was supposed Sorry, to do Dirk. this. But y'all was nice, nice as hell, and y'all just you had a, a team full of dogs. But his legacy is pretty much second to none. Like being with one organization, you know, going through the highs and the lows, and you know, eventually winning the championship in 2011. Glad I was part to be part of that team. Like it was just a whole special experience. I mean, obviously, I mean, you took one championship. Some people may talk about that, but the run you guys made to get that title. You beat us. We were coming off back to back. Swept yeah. us. Beat the brakes off us, San Antonio and OKC. Yeah. And then the big three in Miami. Big three in Miami. That's a hell of a run. That that run was crazy because we had the the best record in the league, and I was the third leading scorer on that ball club. I ruptured my patella uh, January first in Milwaukee, and we had a changeover of four players. Paige Stoyakovich signed on, um, Corey Brewer. Uh, I think we brought Brian Cardinal and then a, a, another guy as well, uh, fill, in, fill in the roster. But, you know, we had three guys to replace the need of, you know, 16, 17 points a night in that system. And that was a lot of changeover. And it took us like 23, 24 games to really, like, develop a new style and a way to play. And basically around Dirk, like his excellence, his leadership, J. Kidd, like point guard, like out there just, mm -hmm. you know, manufacturing points and keeping guys motivated and not letting the steam drop off, we was able to win that championship. Mm. Crazy with you on the sideline too. That's crazy to think about that. Yeah. Um, you make a pit stop in L.A. for two years, uh, historically bad franchise, uh, but we made a nice little run. I mean, ain't no fucking secret. <laughs> uh Lob City, what was your experience like with Lob City? It was dope. It was uh, it was fun because I think having young guys and I I, I really signed to that organization. Obviously, I was thinking life after basketball when I signed there. I was a free agent. I didn't know Lob City was going to mm -hmm. come into that. Right. Yeah, I knew Chris Paul was going to the Lakers. Uh -huh. Like that's what we was hearing. We have everybody uh, thought that. Yeah, you know, I was like, all right, Chris Paul going to the Lakers. Uh, we had the same. Uh, assistant, uh, Miss Wilson at the time. So it was like, okay, that's what's happening on that end. And the, uh, the Clippers was just trying to, like, have some veteran leadership around some of the young guys. So that was BD, right? Blake? No, it wasn't BD. BD was it was already uh, gone? Eric Bledsoe. Mm -hmm. Oh, Young Bled. Yeah, Young Bled. Uh, Eric Gordon. Gordon. Oh, Eric Gordon. Yeah, Ryan Gomes. Uh -huh. uh, all those guys. So, uh -huh. like, I signed on, intending on just being a good vet. 
and yeah, think of life after popping. basketball mm-hmm. and just get business popping in mm-hmm. L.A. And then, you know, um, oh, shit, Chris Paul coming. You know what I mean? Jamal Crawford coming. Like, then, you know, the possibility mm-hmm. of all these other free agents wanting to play with, you know, this team is coming. So it's like, oh, like, now we become a title team, mm-hmm. you know, like overnight. So you go there thinking just, you know, compete at a high level, teach them how to win to now you guys are title contention, your mm-hmm. top three, top four teams in the league. And then following that that next year, now you come. And we had Jamal Crawford, Lamar. Reggie Evans, the Jokers, Lamar Odom, Grant Hill, like Chauncey Billups. It's like, oh, shit, we own to something. Like, what do you think held us up, though? Because I feel like that second year, your second year, uh, my first year, Jamal's first year, Lamar's first year. Like, what was, what do you think held our team back? I've talked to Blake Leadership. About, uh, yeah, not not from uh, us, the locker room, I think. Above. Even, even above. Like, I think from a coaching standpoint, now that I'm in this seat and I'm, I'm coaching and, you know, you, you're talking about everyone wise and, you know, being, you know, leaders of men, you got to make sure that everyone's connected. Now, Chris did all the leadership things as far as from a teammate standpoint, like having dinners where we, you know, bond and connect Mm -hmm. with one another. But, you know, the X and O's and the mission and saying what it was going to be and something that we all can rally around, that wasn't there. Like, people wasn't saying, hey, we're we're trying to win a championship. This is what it is. Like, this is the role you got to play for us to, Mm -hmm. you know, get this accomplished. This is the role you got to buy into for us to get this shit accomplished. That wasn't ever discussed. We we felt it. We tried to play the right way. Like, me and you was tag team in our minutes, but it wasn't like, this is what the fuck you got to do for us to get this. Mm. And that was the drop off. I I like hearing that. 2016, 14 seasons. Decided to hang it up. You just knew it, it was time? Man, I'm gonna tell you, I checked in in Sacramento and in my head I thought I took off, <laughs> but I didn't take off. It was, I was going up for a dump, but I went for a cold ass layup. <laughs> 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 I never left the ground like I intended to leave the ground and I was just like, damn, in my head I thought I was like kind of up there. So, you know, the shit kind of, <laughs> the shit kind of spent in there and went in and I ran the other way and I was like, ooh, like shit. And I watched the film that night. I was like, "That nah, I I can't be out there like mm. that. Like that ain't it." So I was just like, "Man, you know what? I, you know, I got my bread. I got some. I got a lot of shit going on off the court. It's time to pivot and just like do some other stuff." Think back to when you was 15. You know what I mean? To when you was locked up. To you was going through all the bullshit. Didn't know the direction you was going to now. To right this moment. Mm. To where you at now, bro? All the stuff you done accomplished and everything you done been through. How you feel? Uh, man, I'm I'm beyond blessed and I'm 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 grateful and I'm humble for like everything that I experienced. Like even when I was walking up here, like real shit, um I, I got I got my six button suit on. I I'm I'm coming up here and I'm I'm chilling Fresh. with I'm chilling with my dogs, like mm-hmm. and I you know, I applaud y'all for all the shit that y'all are doing appreciate and it, appreciate just that. speaking truth to power on every aspect from sports to politics to the real shit that's happening out here in these streets. But I'm just like, damn, like we have a platform and, you know, we able to just like speak freely on, you know, everything. Mm-hmm. But it's all because like the sacrifices that we made and this is like, like this is the dream for me. Like this is the vision that, mm-hmm. you know, I just, I, I love to see. And I think like it's gonna be so impactful like 20 years from now, 15, 20 years from now, just imagine like what our young king's gonna be doing, our young queen's gonna be doing with their mm-hmm. platforms because of what y'all are doing, what they seen, what we went through, and what how we was able to overcome adversity and all that. Like, the future is scary. Mm-hmm. Motherfuckers need in to watch out. Way. In a good way. Mm-hmm. Definitely. Um, you're real good friends with uh, Mark Wahlberg. Yeah. Um, I don't know if it was room or true. Or is, are you guys working on a project 100%. to kind of tell your story? Yeah. Talk to us about that. Working on a bio. First of all, kit. shout out to Mark Wahlberg. Mm-hmm. <laughs> he let me use his RV out the blue. <laughs> I made a post on Instagram like a month ago. I'm taking my family on a vacation and we need an RV. Then anyone got a plug on rentals. This motherfucker DMs me like, yo, you can take one, the one I use on set. I'm like, I, didn't, I know him, but I don't really know him yeah. like that. And I'm just he, like, he's like that. cool as a motherfucker. Yeah, he's 100%. <laughs> That's dope. Appreciate you, Mark. Go he's ahead. 100% like that. And, yeah. um, you know, I had. I ended up doing Tough Juice, my journey from the streets to the NBA, and I came to him and for the the option to, you know, do a biopic, uh, I signed on with him and his company. And, you know, we were going to shoot two years ago. 
I felt like the script wasn't right. Mm. And when we go back to like having the power or having, you know, have enough equity in the game where, you know, I've done enough in my life where I don't have to go for a quick bag or something like that. It was like, I want the story to be told, right? And I'll tell you why. Like, when you think about the sacrifices that my mother made, my grandmother made, and, you know, because of the theatrics of, you know, Hollywood, mm -hmm. you know, their characters wasn't going to be depicted the right way, you know, from the script. Right. You know, usually you have, like, the highs, the lows, and then you have, like, the white knight that comes and save the day in Hollywood in these mm -hmm. stories. And you got 75 minutes to tell it, or 80 minutes, roughly. And I just wanted to make sure that the script was right. Uh, me and Jordan Fossman working on the script. We got a script that we love, that we fell in love with, that my, my mother loved, my mm -hmm. grandmother liked. And now it's like, all right, let's move the needle. Let's get Dope. this shit done. So we got progress. We got love motion. Love to hear it. And not, a lot of people don't know, too, because you're stick to the business head down. You're a beast in the entrepreneurial space. Do you mind sharing any of the things you're into? Because I know you're all over the place with it. Yeah, so we got, you know, six graduate hotels. Uh, I was just speaking to one of the partners on set about the one that we uh, we bought the old Nathan Hill on the, at the University of Connecticut. Uh, we got a Starbucks. We got a lot of real estate out of Wisconsin. Just bought up the whole block, renamed it Karan Butler Drive. Got oh. community centers. Boss. Uh, got programming. Like we're in a lot of different spaces, mm -hmm. man. Like just yeah. grinding. No, I mean I love. I, we sat down a few times, and you were telling me, "I'm just like God, that. Oh, that too. Oh, that. Like, <laughs> this dude is a beast. So definitely want to shout you out on that for sure." Father of five. What does that mean to you? Man, everything, because, you know, growing up without a father, obviously that was, it left a, a huge stain on a lot of things, but it also taught me about having that boy and what I wanted to be if I became a father. So um, it means everything. Uh, my four little girls, uh, my son who's at University of Irvine, he's going to his senior year, he's playing basketball. My daughter about to go to University of Howard. Uh, I got an 11-year-old equestrian, Fucking ride horses, draw hey, that's all the an things. expensive it's sport. It's very expensive and dangerous. Yeah, it's very dangerous. She fell off a few times, hopped right back up. Mm, good uh, for her. And my youngest child, Gia, she's a uh, part of the diabetic community, uh, JDRF. So she's an ambassador. She does amazing work. She speaks proudly about her condition. She run. That's who run the house. Yeah, she runs the house. She yes. got a ton of personality. So yeah. it's just it's dope to be a father and you know still be able to you know do something that I love you know uh, that I'm passionate about and coach. Talk about the book Shot Clock. Oh man, so Shot Clock, we had a we had an experience a while back, uh, real close to the time where the George Floyd situation happened. And I watch you march, I watch all of us march and rally around that, that cause. But Shot Clock came, the thought and the idea came from, we had went to march to the, the Capitol building mm -hmm. uh, in Racine, Wisconsin, the city court circuit building. And they gave people like time on the clock to um, really talk about their discomforts and displeasures in the community. And I was just like, damn, like you're looking at how much time you can really talk about all the shit that's wrong in the world. Ain't enough. Yeah, it ain't enough. And I was just like, man, that's something that we all up against, time. So I took these kids' stories that I coached, that I seen in the neighborhood, that I was able to mentor, that I was able to, you know, try to help some that fell by the wayside, some that died. And we came up with the title Shot Clock because we're all up against time. Mm -hmm. And we're just telling these stories, these real stories, and hope that they come part of the core curriculum of, you know, school today. You know, it got picked up by Scholastic Sports, so it's going to be everywhere. Uh, that's extremely important, but some of the old stories that you read now from outsiders to Killer Mockingbird, things like that, Great Gatsby, dope stories, amazing books, but I think they're dated, they don't reflect, you know? And they don't reflect way us. Outdated. Yeah, they're way outdated, and they don't really talk and speak to us. So I wanted to make content, and that's something that me and Kobe had in common where we used to talk about, like, ideas and just, you know, make, making content that can really impact young people. Mm -hmm. So that's why Shot Clock is a reality. It comes out, uh, you know, 9 6 and uh, look forward to sharing those stories with the world. Beautiful. Quick hitters, you plus four going to the blacktop. Who you bringing? Shit. Not, uh, not to the gym, to, to the, the blacktop. To the blacktop. Mm -hmm. All right, so I could tell you, uh, you know, 
God rest my soul, my brother uh, Kobe Bryant. I'll take him to any black top. Yeah, you green know. top, purple top, yeah, any he, top. He get busy anywhere. Take MJ. I'm going to need some enforcers, so I'm going to bring both of y'all and shit. I'm going to go and get busy with it. I'm going to coach the team since I'm in that seat now, and I'm going <laughs> to have, have Jay, Cro Jay Crossover get busy Ooh, out there. It's going to be fun. Can't lose. Uh, Can't album lose. you can listen to with no skips. Miss Education of Lauryn Hill. The one and only. Yeah, tap mm -hmm. in, mm -hmm. always. Tap all the way in. First thing you do in the morning, last thing you do when you go to sleep. First Before thing I sleep. do in the morning is, you know, I always look at uh, my capital fund. I look at my statements. I look at what's going in, what's going out. Uh, last thing I do before I go to sleep, I pray. Every night, no matter where I'm at, what city, what state, I pray. FaceTime one of my kids, talk to them. Like, that's, that's my joy. Like, I go to sleep happy. Mm -hmm. That's important. I mm -hmm. dream good. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thanks. That's deep. Uh, funniest thing that's happened to you recently? So I've been slimming down a little bit, and I tried to go in the, in the gym and dunk by myself, and it didn't go like I wanted it to go. Was so it like that, that layup in Sacramento? Yeah, it was worse. It was worse. <laughs> I, I lost the rim. I'll just put it like that. I landed awkwardly, and <laughs> I just I, I just got back realigned, so I'm I'm trying to move real <laughs> gently out here. Gingerly right now. <laughs> <laughs> if you could see one guest on All the Smoke, who would it be? But you have to help us get your answer on the show. Mm -hmm. You know a lot of people. Mm -hmm. You know what? I, I would love, to, like, you mentioned Mark Wahlberg. I would love to see Mark Wahlberg uh, yes. on the show. I would also love to see, uh, you know, Jay-Z on, on y'all's show, just speaking truth to power. Just, mm -hmm. that'd, that'd be dope. Like, I love the Snoop Dogg episode that you mm -hmm. guys had. And, you said two of uh, Dame Dash, need. like yeah. everything. Yeah, so have yeah. Hove on here. That'd be powerful. Hell yeah. yeah. You heard, you heard the end of that question, all right? Yeah, I can help out with that. Yeah, okay, okay. yeah, okay. Yeah, okay, yeah, yeah. We good. Rock Nation. We good. Yeah. <laughs> we good. Well, Karan, man, we appreciate you. Uh, your journey has been, you know, admired. You know, the grind, the perseverance you had uh, to make it through it. And like you said, the way you're sitting here right now and just continuing to pass it forward to others, man, we definitely appreciate that. So we wanted to give you your flowers and also give you this... Uh, all the smoke time legends. My dog, I like that. I mean, it's not this. It's you know, you know. Hey, I have it all tonight. I have it all tonight. In the off Shit. time. Appreciate you. Man, we appreciate you coming appreciate through. Appreciate you pulling up, bro. Uh, man, that's a wrap with Karan Butler. All the smoke. You can catch us on Showtime Basketball YouTube and the iHeart platform, Black Effects. We'll see y'all next week. October. Hello. When you bundle Paramount Plus with Showtime, no one will hear you stream. <gasps> Don't say that. Holy headless horsewoman! I'll be right back. There's something new out there. Oh. <laughs> Watch it all here. This neighborhood is haunted. Stream Paramount Plus with Showtime. Bundle if you dare.